morning class happy to meet you again this is uh, second semester uh, 200 level uh, the course information uh, is as follows now the course title is post 206 why uh, the course code is post 206 why the course title is uh, political ideas it is a three a two unit credit course load and uh, my name is Suleiman Muhammad Bashir from the Department of uh, Political Science, University of Abuja. Now, the essence of this particular course is to see uh, the need to expose the students on the basic issues as it relates to uh, political ideas. Now, the general overview of the course is this particular course is an introduction to Mojo political ideas in their historical context. It seeks to expose the students to various political ideas and how societies are organized or can organize themselves politically. The course as well uh, takes a critical explanation to liberal scholarly definitions as far as political ideas are concerned and it also gives learners the opportunity to identify the best form of government. Furthermore, thorough analysis of various political forms and what they portend towards national development. Now, the entire gesture of this particular course is to seek uh, the possibility of how students can simply understand how societies are organized and how societies are governed politically. Now, there are various uh, principles or various political ideas that informs the nature of leadership in every society. Now, the course objective is to facilitate student understanding of various political ideas Secondly, students will be exposed on the workings of this political idea. Thirdly, emphasis will also be made on the contributions of early, early scholars like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Contributions of other medieval scholars in Europe like August Comte, Karl Marx, Adam Smith, and David Ricardo. We are also going to, or we expected that the course will also uh, make a tremendous contributions or in the area of the contributions of scholars like Machiavelli, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and Jane Jack Russell, who are usually uh, termed as the social contract theoreticians. The outcome of this particular course is that the first and foremost students should be able to define and explain various uh, political ideas that have existed in history. Now, students are also expected that at the end of this course to be able to situate any of these political ideas into Nigerian context. Students should also be able to give different scholarly contributions of political ideas. And finally, students should be able to have a very nuanced understanding of the concept of justice and equality. Now, political ideas and ideologies. The first political idea we are going to consider or uh, uh, devil or uh, concentrate in trying to understand its meaning is liberalism. Now, liberalism was actually an offshoot of the works of people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. According to Adam Smith, in his thesis, The Causes, Enquiry and Causes of the Wealth of a Nation, he argued that nations that practice liberalism are nations that are developing or lessons that can actually develop. And what does liberalism entail from the first instance? Liberalism entails that governments have no business in business. 
or in doing business. In other words, that the government should roll its hands out of economic activities in order to allow the private sector to determine and answer the basic economic questions. And these basic economic questions are what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. As far as David Ricardo is concerned, liberalism seeks to ensure that the private sector are given the opportunity to determine economic activities. Now, the basic ideas behind the idea of liberalism is the fact that man is a judge to be rational. And that since man is rational and is capable of identifying areas and things that he needs to do in order to better his lot and to improve his living condition, it was argued that that same man should be given the opportunity or the liberty to explore various means or various ways through which he can better his lot. Now, the aggregates of the freedom and individuals or the freedom of individuals will now culminate into uh, societal development because it is assumed that when individuals are given the opportunity to participate in economic activities freely without any you know, uh, uh, restrictions, uh, the individual is uh, definitely going to prosper and develop and the cumulative of the prosperity of individual in the economy is now what is going to translate into uh, economic uh, transformation, economic development. Now, there is also another scholar who has actually made his contribution in this regard, and that is David Ricardo. According to David Ricardo, he's also of the opinion that nations that practice liberalism are nations that are likely to develop within the perspective of Europe. Now, the analysis of uh, David Smith, Adam Smith, and David Ricardo are basically anchored because of the fact that the reality in Europe was the type that always encourages uh, private individual initiation or initiative. When individuals are given the opportunity to tap on their talents and initiative, inventions, then certainly development will ensue. But in as much as individual talent is not encouraged, there is going to be stagnation, there is going to be uh, backwardness, and at the end of the day, uh, such societies will, you know, development will elude such societies. Now, the next uh, political idea we're going to look at is democracy. And what we usually know, as usual, uh, on the definitions of democracy is the fact that uh, there are a lot of people that have actually contributed in the area of the title democracy or the subject democracy. But generally, uh, literatures have argued or have presented a particular leader called Abraham Lincoln who have made a significant contribution in this regard. And according to Abraham Lincoln, democracy is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now, what this entails is that first and foremost, democracy, it is a government or it is, it is a system that encourages the participation of people in their respective societies, especially in the area of decision making. Democracies encourage civilians or citizens to participate actively through universal adult suffrage in determining the nature of leaders that will govern them. And at the end of the day, by so doing, they are invariably determining the nature of policies and programs these individuals that are elected will pursue in order to achieve societal development. Now, in this particular regard, there are basic futures of democracy. One of those features of democracy is freedom of speech. In other words, this entails that as citizens, you are at liberty
to express your feelings, irrespective of whether it goes contrary to the feelings of the state, irrespective of your feelings, contrary or goes contrary to the feelings of your fellow citizens. What matters is the fact that democracy encourages people to voice out their pain, to voice out their frustrations, and to air their view. Now, the essence of this is not just to cause disruption. The essence is not actually uh, get to us ensuring that there is chaos or crisis. Rather, the essence of this particular future of democracy is get to us giving the citizens the power to be able to voice out his feelings. Another future or critical future of democracy is periodic elections. In democracies, most of the democratic systems we see globally today have one form of element of elections or the other. And it is in this particular periodic elections that citizens will have the opportunity to appraise and to reassess the performance of various governments. When governments are able to live up to expectation, then what is expected is that uh, in, by the time the next election comes, people will uh, solidly rally behind the incumbent government who has been able to discharge its responsibility or live up to its expectations and to ensure that such a government is re-elected. But in a situation where the reverse is the case, that is, a government or an incumbent government or administration has failed to live up to its responsibility, the, re the expectation is that in the turn of next election, the people are not likely going to support that particular political party or individual per se. And then at the end of the day, the people will have the liberty to elect a different leader who will constitute a new government. And the idea behind it is to give people who have the initiative, people who have the capacity, people have, who have the uh, know-how to be able to take mantle of leadership and to be able to discharge their responsibility, which is expected to actually better the lot of people. How can it better, or can the government better the lot of people? The government can better the lot of people through the provisions of basic amenities like pipe bone water, electricity, housing, infrastructure, schools, and so many other areas which the government could actually intervene. And the expectation is that when you have a people government, a people-oriented leadership, then you are likely to ensure that democracy will continue to deepen in, in its roots in such kind of societies. But when the reverse is the case, there is likely going to be crisis, there is going to be cry, outcry of minorities, there is going to be a lot of tension. And when such tension are not properly managed, it is definitely going to lead into chaos. And when society finds itself in a chaotic situation, then development would elude the societies. And not only that, there is going to be the rise in a lot of antisocial activities. Crime will be in the increase. People who are used to deploying or exploring the religion, regionalism, and other forms of parochial sentiment in creating division among the societies will continue to fester. And the moment such individuals are not being tamed, then you are likely going to have a failed state. Because at the end of the day, neither the government is able to live up to its responsibility, nor the citizens uh, you know, are willing to be able to uh, 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 live up to up to expectation by paying tax, ensuring that they uh, 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 you know, obey the rules and regulations guide, guiding them as citizens, and so many other responsibilities. And in that situation, certainly societies will continue, social society or uh, you know, group will continue to witness stagnation, backwardness, crisis, and upon crisis. Now, another future of democracy is freedom of the press. The press uh, thought to be uh, a process or a, a machinery through which uh, the people will have their 
opinion and ideas being felt and being, you know, uh, sent across various spectrum in the society. Now, when this media are not given a very good opportunity to operate within democratic system, then such societies is actually a, a, a diverge of collapse. It's likely going to be a diverge of collapse. Now, the very instructive, what, is, what remains instructive at this particular point in time is the fact that we must acknowledge the fact that while media independence is very, very relevant and important in a democratic system, we must acknowledge the fact also that this media outfit must also be checkmated because in a situation where media outfit are always, you know, at a race, they are always on a race to get a breaking news. And in the, in the, in the process of trying to be the first media outfit that breaks, you know, uh, 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 or bring up the breaking news, they eventually, you know, uh, 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 look at their core values as secondary. Because when their core values is not fully entrenched in the discharge of their responsibility, when their core values are not fully respected in their relationship between the state and the people, when their values are given secondary position in the way and manner they choose the kind of news they publish and the ones that are not expected to be published or are not expected to get to the public, then such a society, the media has actually lost its relevance. And not only that, the media can as well, in that kind of situation, such media kind of outfit can also be used in creating tension and problem in the society. A clear case in point is the Rwandan genocide, where a business tycoon who owns a particular radio station, and then he used that particular radio station to propagate self half truths, lies, deceit between the Tutsis and Hutus. And at the end of the day, more than a million people were killed. Millions were driven out of Rwanda. But uh, to God be the glory, as we speak, Rwanda has been able to live away from its past because they're able to have a good leader. And this leader is the leader that is people-oriented. This is a leader that always ensures that he rallies the people or he rallies around the people to make sure that uh, they achieve greatness. Today, Rwanda is the country that is beginning to set its path towards development. And I can assure you that if other African nations can begin to take a cue in what the Rwandan president and the people are doing, I can guarantee you that uh, Africa will be the home or the future home for the whole world. Now, another very critical future of democracy is freedom of movement. When people within a particular democratic system are restricted their movement, there's naturally such peoples are being denied or will definitely be denied their rights but when they are given the ability or they are given the room to be able to live in any part of the country then you are only not going to ensure or attain you know integration it will also go a long way to re reduce tension it will go a long way to reduce crisis and not only that the people will have the opportunity to intermarry and to, you know, express and exchange their cultures. And by the time this cultural integration begins to set in among the people, then, of course, development will continue to happen. And once developed, when a set has or tried to explore its strengths and undermine or look down on, on, on its weaknesses, such a nation is likely going to set itself on the path of development. But when the div areas of division are being, you know, found, areas of differences, areas of division are being encouraged and are being propagated, then the society will, all, will not only be balkanized along this regional or religious line, 
there is going to be crisis that will ensue. And when this crisis ensues, development will suffer. And once development suffer, automatically the people will not have the opportunity to reap from the dividends of democracy. Now, aside from democratic system, there are other, you know, democratic, you know, uh, values that are embedded within uh, a nation that claims to be democratic. While some democratic system try to propagate a multi-party system, some other, you know, democracies will prefer to have a two-party or in some extreme circumstances or situations, you have a one-party system. Now, the nature of democratic system in any country is peculiar to the nature of ethnic configuration or, you know, uh, pre-existing nations that have come together to federate or to make that particular nation, you know, indefeasible. Now, it is democracies are not expected to be exported, you know, or to be uh, implemented hook, line, and sinker. What nations are expected to do, or leaders of nations are expected to do, basically, is to identify the relevant futures of democracies that are in tandem or that suit their historical analysis, that suit their ethno cultural or religious configuration and to see how they can practice democratic or democracy in a manner that will give every section the opportunity to participate and to also benefit or reap from the benefit of coming together in a single democratic system. But in a situation where these particular values are not fully recognized or these particular futures are not actually put into cognizance. The, 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 the bottom line is that such nations that practice democracy from the point of view of Western perspective, they are not likely to get, get things right. A clear case in point, a classic example is Nigeria. Nigeria has been a democratic nation for some time. But the question you should ask is, while the Western democracies are trying to advance, while Western democracies are making a lot of feats in trying to deepen their democratic culture, in trying to deepen their you know, civility, and how they can ensure that all segments of societies are properly accommodated within the political system. That of Nigerian case is different, where you see a lot of crises are built at various ends, a lot of secessionist threats coming up. A clear example is the Boko Haram in the north. We have the same, in the, within the same area, region, we have Iswap. We have the recent, you know, crisis of farmers, herders conflict. We also have the, 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 the cattle rustlers. These are crises that are capable of, you know, retarding the nation's developmental prospect. prospect. In the south, we have the IPOP. We also have the Odudua People's Congress and so many other groups who are threatening the corporate existence of the nation. Now, you will ask a question that why democracy has been practiced in Europe is trying to integrate the people and make sure that life becomes easier for them and accommodate them. Nigerian democracy or federalism as it were is creating more problems even though there are scholars that are of the opinion that the fact that Nigerian federal system or Nigerian democratic administration have actually continued to fester, especially from 1999 to date, it is a reason for us or a cause for us to celebrate. But while we also try to applaud the fact that Nigerian democratic system has festered from 1999 to date, without any military intervention, we must also acknowledge the fact that Nigeria has actually never, you know, been this divided. We have more of our political tensions, 
we have economic crisis, we have social cultural troubles, turmoils here and there, and at the end of the day, instead of we making progress and transformation, we are witnessing backwardness and stagnation. Now, aside from democracy, we have monarchism. Monarchism is a concept that requires or that entails a leadership of an individual for the benefit of all. Now, a monarchical or in an ideal monarchical system, it is more or less like a reverse of what democracy or what is obtainable in democracies. Some of the futures of democracies do not actually, you know, enjoy freedom. But in some instances, you can recommend or you can see it that there are societies that are monarchical in nature or whose leadership are monarchical in nature. And these the, the societies are actually making a tremendous progress. Their citizens are enjoying a lot of dividends of democracy. Their citizens are given priority in issues of national importance. Now, in this kind of situation, you begin to wonder and ask questions. Between democracy and monarchy, monarchy or monarchical system, which among these systems that best suits society? Now, it is the nature of the society that will determine, or the nature of leadership, or the character and positions of leadership that will determine whether a nation will be democratic inclined or it will be monarchical. It depends on their historical antecedent. Now, tyranny has to do with the leadership or rulership of an individual for his own personal interest. In a tyrannical system, what you is obtainable is a situation where a leader operates at his liberty. He rules without any limitation. His words are considered a law. His words are considered law, and that if there's anything that comes up in the society that, not, that did not reflect his belief, ideals, and expectation, he considered such things as rejected, and you know, such ideas would not have positions in the society. Now, the next item is a political uh, idea is dictatorship. Dictatorship can manifest in various forms. What dictatorship entails is a system of leadership that an individual has absolute and supreme powers. And these absolute and supreme powers are not being checkmated by any segment of the society. This power that he amass is actually the type that will give him the opportunity to take his decisions at his will. And whatever he deems fit for the society is what will happen. Whatever thing, even if such thing is good, so long as it does not conform with his expectation, such thing is considered as bad and not suitable for the society. But the irony is this. Societies in the world that have leaders that are considered as dictators, these are societies that have been able to, you know, make a giant stride towards development. One of the people that are considered as dictators, for example, in Africa, is Robert Mugabe. We also have uh, the president of Cameroon. Now, if you look at the history of Mugabe and his country, this is a country that has long suffered from colonial exploitation. And Zimbabwe and Zimbabweans have tried as much as possible to see that they work hard towards having a very supreme and strong leader that will put into cognizance their expectations. And he ensured that the land, land was very, very important. It's very important as far as Zimbabweans are concerned because they have a very rich land. They do not only have a rich land, they also have adequate resources that can actually help them to tilt this land for their betterment. Now, prior to Mugabe, Iron Smith, who was the last military, uh, civilian, sorry, 
who was uh, the last colonial leader, invited them to a conference. And in that very conference, they agreed that Zimbabweans, that is Southern Rhodesia, is going to be granted independence. And immediately they are granted independence. He agreed that he was going to ensure that this land is actually uh, left in the hands of the elsewhere colonial masses. But as soon as they gained independence, they were able to ensure that he wielded enough powers to be able to uh, withdraw or take away this land from the Aswal colonial masters and give it back to the people. And because of this particular thing he did, he was called uh, a dictator. And not only that, in most of the elections that takes place, he has always been, you know, uh, emerging as winner. This is not only because the Zimbabweans have Mugabe deep into their heart as the only leader who can actually salvage them from the clutches of the colonial masters. He has the competence to be able to face their, you know, uh, as well colonial masters and to ensure that what is rightful to the people is actually given to them. Now, uh, we move straight into uh, futures of liberalism. And these futures of liberalism includes privatization. By privatization, we mean that uh, businesses or agencies, service-oriented organizations that were hitherto to under government control will now be relinquished to private sector for it to you know, achieve profit maximization and for the business to continue to run. The assumption is that uh, in a period where the state has control over certain you know, economic activities, there's likely going to be you know, uh, inefficiency, there will be lack of productivity, and a lot of other you know, setbacks are likely going to be witnessed. But when these agencies are relinquished to private sector, it is assumed that they are not only going to be efficient, there is going to be productivity, and uh, it's going to be profit-oriented. Now, free trade. By free trade, it requires that nations should break its borders. In other words, there should be free flow of goods and services, flow of movement of goods and services from state to state or from country to country. The liberalists believe that any nation that tries to uh, fully practice this free trade, it is likely going to develop. But the free trade issue has actually been criticized by some group of scholars. This is because they argued that when nations allow free flow of goods and services into nat its nations or into its country, there is the likelihood that the local industries and you know, local investors are likely going to be sent out of business. This is because the nation's technology, especially looking at it from the point of view of less developed nations, the technology in less developed nations will not allow or is not as strong as to that of the technology in Europe. And the implication is that when there is free trade, the implication is that uh, these technologies that are advanced from developed nations uh, that are more superior than that of, uh, that of less developed nations are likely going to soar in the market. This is because their product is going to be you know, uh, more in terms of quality and when it comes to value, when it comes to you know, uh, 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 productivity, it is likely going to be or have an edge over commodities or services that are being provided within the nations. And because of the kind of uh, colonization, the implication or impact of colonialism, which has continued to linger in the minds of our leaders and even the people, most national citizens will always prefer to patronize goods that are from another part of the country or that are from advanced nations. And when citizens prefer to buy items or goods from advanced nations, that is, those who are producing similar goods in their nations are likely going to be out of business because they are not patronized. And once their goods are not patronized, of course, 
the businesses will close. And once businesses close, it's going to create troubles. One of such turbulence is going to create is there's going to be rise in the level of unemployment. There's going to be rise in level of crime and criminality. And not only that, the government will be overburdened. There will be a lot of burden on government to see how it can create spaces. And if you're lucky to have a government that is people-oriented, factories and industry will be created so that the nation can be you know, export-driven or nation's economy can be export-driven. But the moment a nation free or ensured or try to implement this free trade policy, the tendency is that such a nation is going to be a dumping economy or an import-based economy. And once there is a nation, or once an, a nation's economy is turning itself into an import-based economy, the citizens of such nations are, are going to be at risk, their health, and every other thing you can think of. They are likely going to be manipulated and by international economic relations. When nations are incapable of producing you know, commodities that are very, very germane to their existence, then such nations are at you know, the risk of uh, international uh, manipulations. We've talked about uh, democracy in our previous uh, discussions. What we are going to quickly see how we, can, how we can round up is that we'll see how we can talk about commercialization. Of course, there are commercialization and privatization goes hand in hand. Uh, of course, it is basically trying to transfer the ownership and control of certain business interests from the governments, uh, you know, uh, to the private sector. I also have uh, government uh, non-interference. What this government non-interference is talking about is the fact that uh, nations or national government must not in any circumstances or in any case try to uh, enter or do it, go into business activities. This is because when government goes into business activities, there is likelihood to be backwardness and stagnation. But when a, an economy is privately driven or private sector driven, such an economy is going to develop and all of that. Now, import and export. This import, for example, from the point of uh, uh, David Ricardo, uh, he talked about uh, the idea of uh, a nation to specifically specialize in the production of certain commodities that ha it has, you know, uh, uh, an advantage. They call it, they, they, they call it, um, I think, basically, what the export and export is trying to talk about is that when a nation, when a nation tries to make its economy to be export oriented, then it should try to ensure that it only exports commodities that it have an advantage in production. With this advantage in production has to do with the availability of products that they can always uh, mobilize to produce such uh, a commodity. Then wealth accumulation. Basically, wealth accumulation from the point of view of liberalism, it entails that when nations liberalize and allow its economy to be private sector driven, then such a nation is likely going to uh, accumulate wealth from the point of individual, from the point of group, and from the point of uh, nation. Thank you very much. Uh, see you again.